please don't hold a balloon. If you're holding a balloon right now, it might pop. It might just give me a fright, so not a good thing. Are you guys well? Yeah. Great to be together, hey? Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. So we end our series on the book of Acts today. Isn't that amazing? A whole year in the book of Acts. It's been a journey, right? Sure. Tough crowd. It's been good, eh? Okay. You know I don't like quiet church, eh? So just get a little bit Pentecostal on me, please. Glory. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. All right, uh, let's, let's read together. Acts chapter 27, I'm going to read from 20 to, tw- to 38, that's verses 20 to 38, and then uh, we'll skip ahead a little bit, and uh, then we'll pray and get into what God has for us in this passage this morning. A bit of context before we read. Paul is on his way to Rome. He's um, uh, under the custodianship of a... Roman centurion Julius with strict instructions to send him to Rome because there uh, Paul must go on trial. He has appealed to Caesar and uh, he must give an account for why there are charges against him. Um, We've read a little bit of the story where really it was these Jews from Asia that came and stirred up the Jewish people in Jerusalem and uh, brought all sorts of false accusations against Paul. And really the issue is um, why Paul is standing on trial is because he believes in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's on his way now on a ship voyage, and that's where we pick up the story. Verse 20 in Acts 27 reads, For many days neither sun nor stars appeared, and the severe storm kept raging. Finally all hope was fading that we would be saved. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, You men should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. Now I urge you to take courage, because there will be no loss of your your lives, but only of the ship. For last night an angel of God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar, and indeed God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told me. But we have to run aground on some island. When the 14th night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea, and about midnight the sailors thought they were approaching land. They took soundings and found it to be 120 feet deep. When they had sailed a little farther and um, sounded again, they found it to be 90 feet deep. Then fearing we might run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight to come. Some sailors tried to escape from the ship. They had let down the skiff into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes, holding the skiff, and let it drop away. When it was about daylight, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been waiting and going without food, having eaten nothing. So I urge you to take some food, for this is for your survival, since none of you will lose a hair from your head. After he said these things and had taken some bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them, and after he broke it, he began to eat. They were all encouraged and took food for themselves. In all, there were 276 of us on the ship. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing the grain overboard into the sea. Go with me a little bit further down to Acts chapter 28, verse 11. It says, after three months, Paul has now um, arrived... um, in, um, ...in Rome... After this dangerous voyage, it says, After three months we set sail in an Alexandrian ship that had wintered at the island with the twin gods as its figurehead. Putting in in Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, after making a circuit along the coast, we reached Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and the second day we came to Petodi. There we found brothers and sisters and were invited to stay a week with them. And so we came to Rome. 
Now the brothers and sisters from there had heard the news about us and had come to meet us far, as far, from as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And then lastly, I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, that we'd be deeply encouraged by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday I was driving in the church's white star wagon. It's a Mitsubishi. It's like 300 years old, but it's only got 100,000 kilometers on the clock. When you're going 40 in it, you feel like you're going 130. It's an amazing drive. You each need to experience it. My parents actually had the same car. We used to have a blue one. I don't know how many of you experienced vehicle embarrassment as a child. Sorry, mom and dad. But the blue star wagon um, had a distinct, like, gearing down hum about it, as if a spaceship was coming into land, but like an alien spaceship. It was like... (laughs) And uh, outside the gates of Middleburg Primary School, one would just grab your bags and slip away (laughs) quietly, hoping that no one saw you jump into the blue star wagon. Um, I was way too worried about that stuff when I was a kid. Now it's awesome. I'd love one. I'd make it into a camper van. Hashtag van life, right? Okay. Anyway, um, so why was I telling you the story? Anyway, I was driving the white one, which we still own at the church, and uh, I believe that car did a trip to Malawi. Am I right, Dad? It did. I was on that trip to Malawi, all 7,000 kilometers of that trip, and um, we drove in that very same star wagon, and, and I was driving uh, yesterday to fetch the jumping castle that we had borrowed from the church for my daughter's birthday party, and, uh, and I was uh, driving to, to go drop it off, and, um, and I was just reminiscing in that moment. Every now and again, you have these moments with God where you just think like, it feels like the Holy Spirit say to you, like, look how far we've come, eh? And, uh, and I just realized that I had sat in the same star wagon, and uh, as it backfired um, really loud, sounded like a gunshot behind me, um, on my way past Midas at 7 o'clock last night. Um, I just thank God for the, the wild adventure of following Him um, and the danger associated with it, i.e. driving in that star wagon, which um, has a part that's broken. The steering could come apart at any time. But um, the other cool thing was that Malawi trip. Hey? I remember, I don't know where my parents were. They were preaching the gospel. I was swimming in Lake Malawi with the hippos and the crocodiles, unattended. I'm sure I was unattended. Mom, did you know that I was unattended? Was someone looking after me? Because my memory was swimming there, and then later that night, a hippo popping up while we were on some wooden dugout that we had paid 10 quatra to rent for the day. And um, I just thought to myself, wow, would I ever let my children these days be swimming in Lake Malawi? But I'm grateful because my mom and dad showed me that following Jesus is a, a wild adventure that's got danger associated. And, uh, and this is what I want to preach on this morning. Um, but point number one, following Jesus is dangerous. In Acts 27, Paul's on the ship, right? He says, it, Luke writes, by now much time had passed and the voyage was already dangerous. You know that Paul didn't need to be on the ship. Like, I mean, this Paul being on the ship was entirely as a result of following Jesus. Thanks, Jesus. Dangerous voyage. By the way, Paul writes this whole paragraph in one of his letters where he just lists all these like life-threatening situations he's been in. None of them sound fun. Starvation doesn't sound cool. We see this in Acts 21 where he, he, he tells um, the, the believers at Caesarea that um, he says, Stop breaking my heart and trying to convince me to not go to Jerusalem. I need to go to Jerusalem. I've been led by the Holy Spirit. I need to go there. I need to, I need to witness to Jesus. And if it means suffering, then so be it. And that's why Paul is on his way to Rome on this dangerous journey in which they almost get shipwrecked. In fact, they do. But no one dies. And let me tell you this morning that the world is dangerous. John 16, 33, you will have suffering in this world. South Africa is dangerous. And you know what? Jesus knows, Jesus cares, and Jesus is Lord. 
The world is dangerous, friends. John 16, 33 ends, after he says you will have suffering in this world, he says, be courageous, I have conquered the world. You know, following Jesus leads to even more danger in a, in a already dangerous world. Jesus says to his disciples, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Thanks, Jesus. John 15 verse 20, if they persecuted me, which means to suffer emotionally and physically, then they will also persecute you. So following Jesus only adds to this danger. But let me tell you this this morning. Following Jesus is dangerous, but the end is life in heaven. Rejecting Jesus may lead you into comfort and a self-determined pleasure, but the end is fatal. So I'd rather live a dangerous life with Jesus and look forward to life at the end. Number two, our identity and destiny is secure in Christ. So the world is dangerous, but praise be to God that we belong to Him. Paul says in Acts 27, 22 to 25, he urges the sailors and the, and the, uh, the soldiers and everyone aboard the ship. He says, Now I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For last night an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. I just was drawn to verse 23 where Paul says, For last night an angel of the God I belong to and serve. Friends, let me tell you, the world might be dangerous. Following Jesus might be almost, uh, uh, may, may be more dangerous than what the world is already. But your identity and destiny being secure in Christ is a game changer. Do you know that you belong to God? Do you know that you've been a set apart for eternal life in a world that is dying? The Bible goes even further and says that we are the bride of Christ. Do you know that you are being readied lovingly for your wedding day with your Savior? Do you know that we are citizens of another country? The Bible calls it the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Do you know that you are subjects of another king, King Jesus? He is gentle, lowly, and humble in heart. Friends, our identity and destiny is secure in Christ. In Christ. Why do the authors speak about in Christ? Why do they say the blessings of our salvation are in Christ? The eternal life we have is in Christ. The grace is in Christ. Uh, we have no condemnation in Christ. Your redemption is in Christ. You've been washed, sanctified, justified in Christ. All of these scriptures that talk about our blessed salvation is always linked to in Christ. In Christ, I believe it's, it's an absolutely necessary reminder that it's, it's not written, your salvation, your redemption, your condemnation, and your no condemnation, your washing, your eternal life, your future in heaven, is not in what you've done, or in somebody else's hands, or in your success, or in your good works, but it's in Christ. Why in Christ? Because it's on the basis of, in which we inherit these promises. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the judicial, legal framework on which we depend for our salvation. It's entirely His life, death, and resurrection that guarantees for us, that secures for us our identity and our secured destiny in Christ. Rory came and preached that to us at the end of last year. Remember, he preached about our real address we are in Christ. Your soul is saved. 1 Peter 2, 1 verse 23 says, Your new birth is now, it's an imperishable new life. It's an indestructible new life. So the world is dangerous. Following Jesus gets even more dangerous. But let me tell you, your life is indestructible. Your soul cannot be broken. Your soul cannot be thrown away. Paul's language in saying the same thing, Paul just says it differently. He says, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And by love of God, Paul is referring to the saving purpose of God for your life that has been birthed out of His love. That's what he's talking about when he says, nothing can separate you from the love of God. He's not saying nothing can separate you from God's feelings, but they may change. 
He's talking about the saving power of God for you that has secured your identity and your destiny, and it's out of His love. This is what nothing can separate you from. So the world might be dangerous. South Africa might be, be dangerous. Staying in South Africa to preach the gospel might be dangerous. But you know what? Your, de- your identity and your destiny is secure. So you have nothing to fear. The third thing is God divinely comforts and protects us on our journey through a dangerous world. Psalm 31 verse 21 says, Blessed be the Lord, for He has wondrously shown His faithful love to me in a city under siege. Do you remember long ago there was that famous World War movie of that guy that played the piano in the midst of the war? It's a very famous movie. What was the name of that movie? The Pianist. It was The Pianist, eh? That guy playing beautiful music in a city under siege. The psalmist says that he's experienced God's comforts and mercies in a war-torn city that's, that's busy being ripped apart by, by an army. In that moment, he has experienced God's comfort and his mercies and his goodness. I wrote the, read the verse from 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 verses 3 earlier. Blessed be the God of all comforts and mercies. Let's just look at this. Let's just take an excerpt. Let's see how many mercies we can witness in just the passage from, from um, Acts 27 to when, when, they, when they start the journey on the, on the ship voyage to when they end up in Rome. So there's a whole lot of danger. There's a whole lot of uh, near-death experience. There's a whole lot of um, you know, finger-pointing. There's people trying to escape. There's, there's people being bitten by snakes. There's all sorts that happens in this. But look at this. If you just go through it carefully, Acts 27.3, we see strange kindness. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly. Julius, the centurion, that was the Roman officer that was in charge of Paul's imprisonment for that voyage, treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. What else do we see? God's supernatural witness and protection. Acts 27, we read it earlier. For last night an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, don't be afraid. What did he say? I'm going to make sure this voyage comes to its destination safely. Not only you, Paul, but everyone aboard the ship is going to be protected. What else do we see in Acts 27? We see provision, food. I mean, I don't know because they had a couple of stopovers, but it looks like this one was at least two weeks into the journey. And it said night and day they didn't see the, si- the, 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 the sun or the moon or the stars. So that it's basically the author's poetic way of saying there was a severe storm that kept raging on and on and on. And after 14 days, no one's eaten anything because of superstition or something like that. And Paul says, I urge you to take some food. So here's the thing. On a shipwreck in the middle of the Mediterranean, and if you look, they literally were in the middle of the Mediterranean. There's still food for them to eat. How many of us are worrying about food? Are you on a ship ship that's destined for a shipwreck? Then you've probably got reason to start worrying about if you've got food or not. And in this moment, Paul, an example of our salvation to us, he still has food. He didn't buy it. He's a, he's a prisoner. The world is dangerous, but God's mercies and comforts will meet us along the way all the time. What do we see in Acts 28? Extraordinary kindness. It says the local people, this is when they land on the island of Malta. The, the, the land is a soft word. They literally got shipwrecked and swam to the island of Malta. The local people, people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in since it was raining and cold. How many of you have been wet and cold? It's probably the worst thing that can happen to you next to throwing up. (laughs) It's the worst thing that can happen to you. How kind is God that he would bring a kind, extraordinary kindness to make a fire, to make sure Paul was not warm, or was not wet and cold, but warm and dry. Acts 28 verse 7, hospitality and the choicest gifts, now also on the island of Malta. Now in the area around that place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Paul, I thought you were a prisoner. Here he is sitting in a rich man's house enjoying the benefits of an estate. The world might be dangerous, but friends, following Jesus is more dangerous. But friends, you will be met 
with extraordinary kindness and hospitality and the choicest gifts along the way. Acts 28 verse 10, they heaped many honors on us, and when we sailed, they gave us what we needed. Our needs are met. So I want to tell you this morning, when Paul arrives in Rome, he gets to the end of his journey and he says, Now the brothers and sisters from there had heard the news about us and had come to meet us as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and he took courage. So maybe you're here this morning and maybe you feel like your life or livelihood is in danger. And maybe you feel like your job, your well-being, your health, your family is on the edge. And you feel threatened by what's going around on around you. You feel like tomorrow is not going to bring good news. You maybe feel like you've got nothing left for tomorrow. Maybe this morning you feel distressed about the uncertainty and the pain of the Omicron thing or whatever it is of governments shutting borders, of holiday plans coming crashing down, you're facing a trial, you've lost your job, life is dangerous, the world is dangerous, the world is uncertain. Let me tell you this morning, if you just stop and think, you will actually be able to recount in the last 24 hours the kindness and the mercy of God in your life. Did you hear the rain? Did you feel a bit of the sunshine on your face? Did you have your family around you last night? Did you kiss your child goodnight at bedtime? Did the world fall apart? Or was God upholding it in the midst of its chaos? Is God still with us? Yes. Do we, are we, do we have to worry? No. Because, friends, we so easily miss the many mercies of, and comforts of God. This morning, I want to ask you to consider those many mercies and comforts. The journey may be dangerous, but our real life is safe and secure. Heaven is guaranteed. Our ending has been written in the book of life. So I ask you this morning on Thanksgiving Sunday to thank God and be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.